Good afternoon, everyone. This is your host, Guillermo Salvatier, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and our Perspectives on Energy. Uh, today, we'll be talking about utility line workers and what their different salary structures look like across the country. So anyway, I am, as I said, Guillermo Salvatier. I'm the Director of International Services for the Health and Safety Institute, hsi.com. And a lot of the uh, work we do involves uh, training utility personnel. So I figured uh, this would be a great opportunity to let everyone know of um, the trades. And one trade in particular, skilled labor, is utility line workers. Uh, formerly, they were called linemen, but now, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of, it's not only men doing the uh, climbing of poles and getting on bucket trucks and doing all this, like, very, very rewarding, but hard work, right? So um, we'll talk. We'll talk about some of the trends that we're that we're looking in the, at in the industry, uh, especially given the fact that uh, over the last couple of years, it, it's it's there's there's been a shift in um, how people value the, the college education, and then there's been like a growing trend of uh, parents and young adults moving towards back to back to the craft and the trades and skilled labor. And one of these, of course, is uh, becoming a line worker. Now, mind you, there, there's a huge amount of demand for plumbers, electricians, carpenters, uh, bricklayers, this sort of thing. And, and it is this, uh, this is even uh, with the additional level of, of skill. And uh, in a lot of cases, involves a little bit of physical ability. So, um, of course, it usually involves working outside, working in some inclement weather. Uh, operating heavy equipment, having a chauffeur's license. That's right. Me in my past, uh, I worked for thirty over thirty years in the utility industry. So for me, I got to work quite a bit with some of these line workers, and they're great, great people, and really hardworking personnel. Most of them are in the uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, which is their union. A lot of that is uh, organized labor, and um, a lot of the a lot of the uh, standards are pretty much universal. When I was in Florida, um, there were a lot of line workers that had had their line lineman or line worker ticket from Cuba, but uh, the, a couple of companies would come and hire them, and they would be uh, working for the utilities in, in South Florida. Usually, they didn't even speak the language. They only spoke Spanish, but usually their foreman was the one that was bilingual and that would manage a lot of the work. So. All right, so uh, a lot of these, well, actually, all these stats came from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. So, uh, and the, you'll see the link at the bottom of every slide. So you can access all this information on there, and it's on that page. But here we'll talk about a few things and highlight a few items. And it will probably blow your mind, right? Because remember, this, this, these salaries are all based on a 40-hour work week. You're not even looking at overtime, double overtime, you know, uh, double overtime and a half. So those numbers can become even higher. But let's go ahead and go to the next slide. If you would please. Right. So in this case, right, we're looking at the national estimates uh, for electrical power line installers and repairs, right? And you kind of see how many there are in the country. So uh, right now, at the, at the time of posting, this is like last year. We're looking at 119,000, and then there's usually a mean hourly wage at 39, well, it's just under 40 bucks an hour. But you're also looking at what they make in a year is eighty-two thousand dollars, right? So in a lot of cases, right, you're looking at this math here, and and doesn't always account for uh, it's not accounting for overtime, right? So that's an important thing to understand because a lot of these like uh, they're bargaining unit, they're organized labor. A lot of these uh, positions, the moment you go beyond that eight hours a day, it's not even forty hour a week. The moment you go beyond that eight hour a day, you're starting to earn time and a half. So that. $40 an hour becomes now $60 an hour. So it's a really, really interesting uh, situation when it comes to this organized labor. And this isn't something that you can outsource. This isn't something you can send and offshore. I mean, these are people that have to be here and do the work. And given the fact that we are expanding the, our distribution, we're expanding our transmission systems. You know, the, you know for a fact this is this is something that's it's it's not only going going to maintain itself, but it's going to the demand for it will grow. Not to mention the fact that the uh, there's quite a lot of them retiring right now. So this is going to be quite a bit um, fascinating to see what's happening. I see on the next on the on the, on the second table uh, on the same slide, you're looking at the percentages, right? So. 50% uh, of them, for the most part, make about $39.59, I mean, $39 an hour, but you have the, the, the top 
The top 10% makes about $55 an hour. Of course, those are usually in areas where the cost of living is really high, California. But that being said, remember, uh, there's a lot of states where they're making this much money, but not every part of California is as expensive to live in. So that's an important thing to point out, right? So if you're making that much money per hour in that state, but you manage to live in an area which is more, more or less remote, your cost of living is low, now you have the ability to really accumulate some wealth, especially with some of these 401k and pension plans that they have, right? And imagine somebody at fifty five dollars an hour is now working overtime, which is very common given the the amount of shortages that we have out there in labor. Well, you know for a fact that you know they're going to easily break that number within the, the first six months of the year. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, here we have the distribution, right? Uh, of course, the, this is the industry profile for electrical power installers and repairs, right? Basically, line workers. We're looking at different parts of the industry, right? So you got utility system construction versus utility power generation, transmission distribution. This overall, those vertically integrated utilities. And then of course, uh, interestingly enough, the natural gas distribution, there's usually a portion of that industry that has uh, utility utility type of like infrastructure uh, associated with, with it, right? As you can see, anything with natural gas out there, uh, especially when a lot of that is fed electrically, right? Uh, usually that's on the on the natural gas part of the property. Uh, a lot of that work is so specialized that they actually pay them quite a bit more than the utility person, or even though they're doing the same work, it's just on a different part of the fence, uh, so to speak. As you can see here, they're making $57 an hour, the very last row. And so for the annual mean wage of $118,000. Now, if you can imagine this, imagine somebody who's 21, 22 years old, maybe 23 years old, making that kind of money, base pay. That's 40-hour work week. Uh, that's quite significant, right, in that case. So this is something to keep in mind, right? Um, now, utility system construction, right, where, meaning that you're not doing the uh, trouble calls, you're not doing the uh, storm restoration, you're just doing new construction, nice, new, clean, and you're traveling around. Well, those tend to be the least uh, the least paid, right? So for them, it's $34 an hour. In a lot of cases, those are probably contract work that are even in the union, but a lot of them have. Uh, there, there, there are many right-to-work states where they don't have to do that kind of like uh, join a union, but most of them do. So that shows you the spread in this case, right? Okay, next slide, please. Now, uh, highest concentration of employment, right? So you, if you're gonna see uh, the ones that have the most, of course, are the utilities, that's at 15%. You see that percent of industry employment, so you have the most of them. Natural gas, really, it's not even at the bottom, right? The, the, that's a considerable uh, spot to get into. And natural gas distribution, in this case, probably is, is a rather lucrative field to get into if you can get into that. Uh, and not every state is eager to shut down uh, natural gas production and distribution, right? You, you only see that happening in certain states. But in those that do, for example, the, the natural gas is still running, are, they tend to pay a whole lot more than states that only have electrical. So it's very interesting how this, this spreads out. But as you can see, the, the, the building equipment contractors are one that, that have the least amount of uh, employees, and they're pretty much paid the least, right? Whereas the... Um, the vertically integrated utilities that have generation, transmission, distribution, well, those tend to have the most employees or the most line workers you know, uh, working in their organizations. Next slide, please. So top paying, right, industries in this case. So like I said earlier, right, natural gas distribution is one of them, of course, the thought, and then of course, it kind of trickles down commercial machinery, and then uh, electrical power generation transmission, that's the least paid. But again, it keeps, uh, if you can focus on, on, on being a electrical power and start and repair in the natural gas distribution site, right? That's gonna be interesting. Another example, of course, are utilities that have for, that have both together. And one example of this is a uh, link of, uh, think of a, a, power, a Pacific Gas and Electric, which is PG&E in California, where they sell both uh, electric energy and they sell natural gas. So that combined together, they that's where they have that kind of like that kind of like a revenue and uh, and they can pay pay that kind of salary. But remember, it's not every city in California is that expensive to live in. I mean, I've been in places such as uh, Vacaville, California, to do some work, and that you can still get a house there between three and four hundred thousand dollars in some places. It's remote, it's rural, 
but the point is that you know there there are areas in California that are affordable still. It's just they're a little bit remote. But you know, again, uh, so a lot of this, these a lot of these jobs, you can end up traveling for work, be gone for several weeks, come back, and uh, a lot of what I would have, what I would do, of course, was usually in the hurricanes. Right, I would end up being out of town for several weeks at a time, then we'll come back. And my my job didn't get me time and a half like like the line workers did, but uh, seeing their their kind of salaries, it was really impressive to see what they were bring home after a period of four or five, six weeks. Next slide, please, number six. And here on this map, uh, we have uh, basically the states that uh, employment power line and solders were repairs by state. Right? This is back from May of 2022. And we're seeing some of these darker states, right, that um, usually uh, states that are in dark, the dark ones like Texas, Florida, Georgia, California, those tend to have the most uh, con the higher concentration of these like uh, uh, line workers. And the, the interesting thing here is that you see how it's it's the lighter green is fifty to six thirty. Then the next shade of green is six forty or fifteen seventy. Then it's uh, so so the range is not that far apart. But that last dark one it goes from three thousand to eleven thousand. So that's quite a big range in that case. So it can be anywhere between those two numbers. My point is that usually these are the states where a lot of that. Um, electrical infrastructure right now is being developed, whether it's 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 new, whether they're trying to build lines, supply those renewable resources on one side of the spectrum, where the other side of the spectrum, they could easily be working on projects that have to do with natural gas and electricity together, right? So you see uh, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina, all the states down there, they are pretty dense when it comes to having a lot of personnel employed for that industry. At the same time, those are very populous states. So uh, a, a lot of concentration of people, whereas when you move to the Midwest or the uh, or the, or the Rockies, right, those areas tend, tend to be not very, not very congested. However, the salaries there are, you're going to see that in another map, they're still pretty high compared to California. So keep that in mind. Next slide, please. All right, so states with the highest employment level and, and uh, for these personnel, of course, Texas has the highest number and employment per thousand jobs. So in this case, Texas is really growing and developing this industry quite a bit. A lot of that is in the renewable uh, field, right? And following that is California. And of course, after that is Florida. So a lot of work going on there as well. But as you can see, you know, the hourly mean wage, Texas doesn't pay as high compared to California, for example. So it's rather interesting in this case, right? Let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, so here we go. The annual mean wage electrical, so uh, these personnel. And what, what I find interesting here is that the very dark blue, the darkest blue circles, right? You see California, the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, and all, the, all these other like uh, northern states in the Rockies, right? Idaho, Montana, and Minnesota, and uh, North Dakota. So those states have to pay a lot, a lot more than some of the ones in the South or even Texas, right? And it's an interesting thing to point out because a lot of these, uh, I guess the West Coast may have a higher cost of living, but they have a lot of projects, but so do the ones in the North, right? Uh, but then again, living there is a little bit more harsh of a condition, but you're making a considerable amount of money for a very low cost of living. And if we look at Hawaii also, by the way, Hawaii is a rather a very high, uh, very high mean wage for those uh, those line workers. So all all these viewers in Hawaii, for example, you could, you definitely know that your line workers are very well paid. And if you're a line, if you're somebody thinking of getting into the trades, well, Hawaii is a really great place actually to look into, given the fact that how the economy is. And now I'm not sure what the housing market in Hawaii or the cost of living in Hawaii looks like. I imagine it's high. So that salary is usually commensurate to and matches what that place demands, right? But so just to keep that in mind, it's important, it's consistent with what cost of living uh, is, of course, uh, re reflected on the on the uh, average salaries in that place. Next slide, please, number nine. So the top paying states in this case, which is interesting, right, is uh, uh, here you're looking at Connecticut, right? And then, of course, Hawaii is coming in a second. Now, you can see here, Hawaii only has 400 line work. So, you know, if you're looking at if you're just getting out of high school and you want to find yourself an interesting trade or craft and you don't want to go to college, you don't want to get into or you just want to get an AS and then go to like a line worker school, well, Hawaii might be the place. Now, my concern is there may not be a lot of line worker education 
for land worker colleges in Hawaii. Uh, usually you see that in the uh, community college system, but uh, definitely a place to make some, a really earn a good living in, uh, in beautiful Hawaii. Uh, I do imagine you'd have a lot of hurricane restoration or, uh, out there in that part of the world, which of course keeps you busy, but at the same time, you're going to have opportunities to earn quite a bit of overtime. And then we're going to Oregon, Washington, and California. Those are places where the cost of living, again, is high. But you're also engaged in a lot of like, renewable projects. So you may be seeing quite a bit of that as well. Next slide, please. And this is where a lot of them are employed. Uh, this is all by concentrations in area. So uh, that gives you an idea of how this breaks down. And of course, this presentation will be see us later. Next slide, 11. Uh, so now we're looking into metropolitan areas, right? the highest employment level in these uh, workers. So you, usually in Texas, Houston, the Woodlands, Sugarland, of course, it has the highest rate. And then, of course, all the way to the bottom is Riverside, uh, San Bernardino, Ontario, Canada. So, okay, sorry, California. California. So in this case, you're looking at uh, uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. I mean, that's a place where, where I, I spent most of my career working, right? Uh, that has, for example, employment per thousand jobs is just uh, under... Uh, 0.74. So that definitely an interesting place to, to work. Not the highest paying of all, but then again, they have the uh, the highest, um, uh, it's, it's among the highest of uh, employment levels for these line workers. Look at the next slide, slide 12. Highest position of jobs, uh, the, the Catter, Alabama in this case. So again, Florida falls into the villages. This has the highest concentration of jobs in this field. But once again, right, California falls up there. And then I don't see Hawaii in this list, apparently, based on this metric. But it's really interesting to notice, right, where, where the industry this, this is falling into. All right. Next is the annual mean wage, just slide 13. And uh, we're looking at uh, here, for example, you're looking at the high, and, and, and again, it's consistent, right, what, what we're looking at in this particular example. Uh, annual mean wage. So you're looking at different areas. Now, Hawaii here, it's like some islands make a lot more than the other bigger islands, the smaller islands. So there, there's like, you know, a, a little bit of discrepancies between the islands, but in California and all the West Coast, you see that it pretty much generally is really, really high. So it's a really interesting scenario there in this case when it comes to uh, all this employment. Slide 14, please. Next one. All right. So top paying metro areas, right? In this case, of course, is Sunnyvale, California. Uh, that has the highest. And just look at that figure. $127,000 a year at $61 an hour. And I go, that's the hourly mean wage. And then uh, just say all the way down to like, for example, California. So as you can see, it's all these Western states. And then, but you know, not falling far behind is... Hawaii, well, one, one of the Hawaiian islands out there. So you look at somebody's earning about $116,000 a year, which is not a bad living right, for like a uh, utility line work. So something else to keep in mind in this case, right? Now, you know, uh, I'm not trying to convince you to be a line worker. It is dangerous, hard work. But when it comes to this new renewed interest in the trades, I mean, would you rather be a line worker? Or would you rather be an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter? I mean, those are all important, necessary uh, professions, and they're becoming even more so now where, where a lot of them are retiring. But um, these are definitely attractive when it comes to uh, doing a 40-hour a, a work week and then being paid uh, quite a bit extra in a time and a half when you're having to work a little bit, a little bit beyond your normal hours, right? So, so these are non-metro areas. Okay, so let's go to the slide, slide 15, please. Next one. So non-metro areas are the highest employment for these personnel. So uh, non-metro, of course, meaning they're not as big or they're more rural, more remote. These are a little bit different. So you're looking at uh, some areas that, that, of course, don't pay as high in these cases, right? So again, when you select where do you, you want to go work, having this data is important so you can make a decision to decide where you want to go work, especially after you've gotten yourself your, your, uh, your opportunity to join an apprenticeship. But you know, if you're all the audience here thinks like Hawaii, most of you are in Hawaii. I certainly recommend you look at you know the look becoming a line worker. It's a it's a great opportunity, a very rewarding career. Everybody who's a line worker who I know, uh, especially nowadays, the the level of safety and the and the equipment, and the training, and the and the importance that 
the industry now places on keeping the line worker safe is, is so much different than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, night and day to 20 years ago when I was first in the industry. And me being an engineer, I worked a lot with a lot of these line workers. And I can tell you that this thing has dramatically changed. So um, important to keep that in mind. So it's still hard work. You still have to learn how to climb poles. You still have to work with uh, stuff that's, that, that's potentially fatal or deadly. But uh, everything can be done safely, given the correct tools and the correct um, training right, and practices, best practices. Okay, uh, slide 16, please. Again, some of the stuff, again, the concentration, similar we saw earlier. And then the very last slide, slide 17. Uh, top. Paying, here we go, top paying non-metro areas, right? So once again, uh, coast of Oregon, non metro so, so if you want to live in Oregon, but not live, for example, in Portland, you know, you can still find areas in there that, that you can actually have a pretty good living without having to live in the highly concentrated, uh, expensive parts of that little state. Same thing with California here, uh, uh, also in California, and then, of course, Central Oregon, non metro area. And the, there is a concentration in, there, in these non-metro areas that, that do pay quite well. So in Hawaii, for example, so we remember, you might be able to do it quite uh, nicely as, as a career. And, and uh, you can really accumulate a, not, not just a wage, a wage earning, but uh, also a pension, retirement, 401k. Uh, you can start putting money away as early as 19, 20 years of age, and a lot of these places match your retirement. So if you're putting away like a good, you know, if they match four and a half percent, it's almost like you're putting away seven, seven percent. And they're, they're giving you that 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 extra bump in money. Right. So if, you, if you're not putting away at least what they match, you're leaving money in the table. And then not to mention the fact that, you know, historically, the stock market has done about eight percent. So, you know, after about 20 years, 25 years, if you began early enough, you could easily retire in your mid to late 40s with, you know, well, well over a million dollars, sometimes more. So if you have that retirement money, you may have a pension, you get a social security, you have properties that you've actually invested in and paid off. And, you know, the, you, this is a one quite the opportunity and you could do this often enough without any any uh, cottage debt. So there's uh, quite a bit of programs out there, uh, given the fact that there's so many shortages in, uh, in uh, this crafts and trades that you can probably get yourself a free ride in a lot of cases. Uh, so again, um, I'm not sure I, I know the uh, Hawaiian education system, but I definitely encourage all the viewers that are in Hawaii to take a closer look at their uh, vocational programs in their high schools and take a look at the community colleges in, in their system to actually get better acquainted and better educated on what's available. And I do know there's quite a bit of opportunities here in the mainland when it comes to line worker or lineman colleges. Uh, and a lot of them are not that expensive. A lot of them have scholarships available. A lot of them have a lot of financial aid from the, uh, from the federal government and state government. So plenty of opportunities. And you gotta remember, wherever there's a demand for, there's a shortage and there's a demand for labor, you're going to find great opportunities. So if you get in there. Now, if you're a parent, and you're concerned that your child is, uh, your, your your young adult child is going to into the trades, I would I would really put you at ease in the understanding that a lot of these like uh, careers are are very very lucrative. They're not as dangerous as most people imagine, and um, for the most part, right? You you may be a site, but they end up being really rewarding careers. Whereas once you're done with the work, you leave work behind. Uh, you don't bring work home with you like you normally do. And then when you have a call out, it's just the the amount of overtime you can make is amazing. Being on call is another great opportunity to actually just sitting at your house waiting on call means you're still being paid by the hour to wait, which is an, an amazing opportunity. And in a lot of cases, right, a lot of these jobs, a lot of these careers, you still are given the opportunity to go to school while you're working. So you, you, you're not always locked into these like 40 hour, 50 hour, 60 hour work weeks, right? And in a lot of cases, man, so you, you can still have opportunities for greater education. And um, I myself, you know, went to a little bit of alignment college for, for some time, learn how to climb poles. It is hard work, learn how to operate a bucket truck. I didn't become a line worker, I ended up becoming an electrical engineer. But but, but the point is, though, that, that that is definitely a highly rewarding career. I think it's fun. Uh, the environment, the climate's a little tough sometimes, uh, given the weather where it's hot or it's rainy or in some places where, you know, part of the Northeast in the U.S. is really cold. 
um, dealing with wildlife sometimes, but at the same time, it, it's a very fun, rewarding career for anybody who gets into it. Uh, and it's not, it's predominantly men, but I have seen quite a lot of women do very well in, the, in these uh, in these fields also. And they move very quickly through uh, through, through, the, through the career path. And they eventually, most of these jobs, uh, you end up working at, through and, and and you get promoted to the point where you're a, four, a, four, a four, foreman, a four person, you end up being a supervisor, or you end up, uh, for example, in a control center ultimately. And again, great, great progression. And a lot of them retire early. They do very well. They retire in their like, in early to mid 50s. And, to, and some of them go back as consultants to make even more money. So again, don't, uh, don't be discouraged by the, by the trades uh, because these can do very well. And uh, it's definitely something that the industry needs. And there's a huge demand for it. And there's quite a shortage. So again, uh, leave me comments below if you have any, uh, anything you want to ask. I'll try and res respond. But uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today. And uh, once again, we'll look at this some more. And uh, feel free to shoot me a comment or send me an email, and I'll try my best to respond. But thank you again. Have a wonderful afternoon, and uh, best of luck to all of you.